Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. And welcome to part two of our interview with Paul Buckheit. Paul is a college teacher at DePaul University in Chicago. He's a writer for progressive publications and the founder and developer of social justice and educational websites like usagainstgreed.org. Thanks for joining us again, Paul. Okay, thank you, Jessica. So, Paul, let's just pick up from where we left off and talk about the banking sector. Many have linked the stock market crash of 2008 to the actual repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the effect of deregulating banks and what is the alternative, in your view, of, of that type of system? Well, you mentioned Glass-Steagall, and that's, that's key. You know, it's, it, it's, it's been remarkable to, in my mind, uh, uh, astounding that we didn't learn our lesson from the Great Depression. I mean, Glass-Steagall was implemented specifically to, to um, separate the investment banks and the commercial banks, so, so this wouldn't happen, what happened in, in 2008 with the, with the mortgage crash and the derivatives and, you know, the, um, uh, the wild speculation. It, it, it hurts the great majority of Americans are hurt by the by the speculation in the financial industry and the banks, but they lobbied for a repeal of Glass-Steagall and they got their way. And um, that was in the late '90s with Clinton, and it's it's hurt almost all of us. The only people that have not heard are the um, the banks, of course, the CEOs, the hedge fund managers who are well positioned to make literally billions. I mean, think of that. You know, what used to be a pretty egalitarian society in the, up until like 1980, it's been getting worse and worse. And now, in the last 10 years or so, we have, as middle America has gone backwards, losing like 35 percent of of of, um, of its net worth, mainly in its in in homes. We have individuals out there that are literally making billions of dollars a year. I mean, that's, um, and it's all because, again, this deregulation. Now, um, I, I'm not totally, uh, it might sound like it, but I'm not totally anti-capitalist. I think it can work if it's regulated. And I think the evidence shows over the last 30 years that that's exactly exactly the case, That, um, or over the last 100 years, that you, you capitalism, if, if you don't regulate it, then greed takes over. Uh, I don't know if it's human nature, but but that's how it works. Okay. And let's talk about your next point about prisons and the prison industry that has become increasingly more privatized. How does making a revenue-generating business of incarceration affect rehabilitation? Well, again, uh, the, the current studies, the recent studies have shown that private prisons are not well managed. There's the profit incentive there. So, so their services are cut, cut back, you know, the quality of the food and the, and the, um, the, the, the prison conditions themselves, you know, the, the maintenance, uh, the guard staff, you know, it's, it's cut back as much as possible so that profits can be made. And that's not what, Prison is supposed to be about rehabilitation, about making, getting people prepared for society again. But with a private system, there, the incentive is to get more people into prison. Um, Chris Hedges said that, uh, or estimated that private companies make about $40,000 a year on an inmate. So, of course, they're going to try to fill the prisons and, and get as many as they can. So that ties in, sadly, to the whole, um, Mich Michelle Alexander wrote the, about the new Jim Crow, you know, how uh, drug arrests and, um, and now school to prison pipeline. There are more and more ways to get young people who haven't really done that much wrong or maybe nothing wrong. You know, they're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And they're getting stopped and frisked or, or, or accused of crimes, be put, put in jail. And... Um, even if it's just for a short time, you know, there's a lingering effect where some studies, a couple studies I've read have shown that once a kid is put into jail, even once, he or she is more likely to be a repeat offender because the stigma is there. You're, you've been in jail, you know, and, but it all feeds the profits of the industry. 
Okay, let's change gears and look at education. Um, we are seeing the continuing push for the school choice or a voucher system, essentially, that would be privatizing a sector that is considered to be a right, um, a public sector, which is education. Can you talk a little bit about, um, are you seeing this push to privatize education? Just a move by, by capital needing a place to go, really? Is this just a new area to colonize? Well, yes. If there's any one area of, of these eight that 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 um, bothers me the most, it's education. Because the, the idea of taking, uh, of trying to um, con view our children as products, that's basically what's happening. And, and that's just unconscionable, you know, that that you can think of a child as um, as a source of income, and and it doesn't even work. I mean, the, the most famous, um, well-known study is is from Stanford, the Credo to, uh, study, which was done in 2009, and now um, three or four years later, it was updated, and it continues to show that charter schools and uh, private, private, privatization in general does does not work any better than the public system, and and perhaps even not as well. And again, here in Chicago, it's you know with 50 schools being closed, and the same issue is in Philadelphia and and other um, cities around the country. What what's happening is is the money is being drained out of the public system, and and then the public system starts to fall apart, and then everybody blames. Um, government and then private privatizers come in and say well we can solve your problems you know but it again it's it's a money making proposition and it's hurting the great majority of us but i i think people don't even realize that what's what's really happening how insidious this is that that um the privatizers are blaming uh, the communities for um for failing, when in reality it's the it's the, the draining of the money from the public system. Okay, Paul, let's look at your last point about consumer protection. What are the effects of unregulated privatization on consumer protection, and can you give us some examples? Well, yes, there are three recent examples. The, um, the explosion in the Texas fertilizer plant killed a lot of people, and uh, the Arizona forest fire kill like 19 firefighters. And up in Quebec, there was a disastrous train wreck that killed uh, a lot of people. Every, all three of those cases uh, or those instances followed uh, deregulation. So uh, like the Texas fertilizer plant hadn't been inspected in like 25 years. Uh, the In Arizona, the, the budget cuts, uh, the sequester caused a lot of firefighters and fire equipment to be uh, cut back. And in Quebec, the same thing, you know, the, the rails were deregulated. So those are just three examples, but, but, but there's more. I mean, if, if you look at how important the FDA, the, the, um, uh, the EPA uh, and FEMA, you know, uh, Hurricane Sandy, how important it is to have these, these protection systems uh, through public funding to help all of us instead of just trying to provide profit for a few people and cutting back on everything else. The cutbacks are, are damaging our country, and, and, and it's only the, um, the, the, it's only the, the, the media, the people controlling the, the media with the propaganda that is causing... Um, uh, people to vote against themselves, basically. You know, people don't realize that that, uh, that this rampant deregulation is and privatization is, is, is hurting themselves. Well, Paul, thank you so much for walking us through your piece, Eight Ways Privatization Has Failed America. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.